Good afternoon. I love a full house. And so we're looking forward to a very robust dialogue this afternoon where we'll first hear from panelists, but what's the most important part of this afternoon's conversation is hearing from all of you. And using the panelists to ask the questions that have been nagging you about this issue. And giving, helping us give voice to a broader community on the big question of how do we address the challenges of pandemics and whose problem is it? We have a great panel this afternoon. And on the panel this afternoon, of course, we have Kofi Annan, the chairman of the Kofi Annan Foundation. We have Professor Samba, who will be joining us shortly, who is the coordinator of the emergency operations for the Center Against Ebola and advisor to the president of Mali. Uh, Mr. Jeremy Farrar, the director of the Welcome Trust. My friend and colleague, Valerie Amos, who is currently the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency and the Emergency Relief Coordinator for the United Nations. Uh, and I should say, Battleness Amos. Uh, and of course, Stanley Bergman, the chairman and CEO of, Hen of the Henry Schein Group. We could spend all afternoon talking about this issue, but we only have a brief time together. So during that time that we have together today, what we'd like to do is look at strategically at our world's responses or lack of response and our capacity or lack of capacity to addressing diseases, disease outbreaks, and avoiding uh, um, pandemics. Of course, Ebola is the key and the central context for this discussion today, because as, me, as, as we all know in this room, six to nine months on from its beginnings in West Africa, we now are addressing the challenges of Ebola creeping into an urban community for the first time and impacting three governments severely and a number of other governments <clears throat> in a less detrimental manner, but driving attention around the world. And we know Ebola is, of course, a complex global crisis, even if it is now only in three countries. Because a, a one Ebola case anywhere is a crisis everywhere because the possibility in a global society is real. So the only way to stop it is to stop transmission, to treat every last case, to get to zero. And although the number of cases are decreasing today, we know that there is still an active outbreak and, outbreak and we must continue to be vigilant in our response. We also know that with the ever encroaching position of man into more communities where the possibility for transmission of zoonotic diseases is more likely the possibility of new, different disease outbreaks is real. And the question is, are we ready? So together with these panelists today, this is esteemed panelists, we will discuss the lessons that we've learned as a global community and talk about ways to go forward. How do we avoid pandemics? How do we raise the alarms earlier? How can we work better with communities? How must and should we coordinate to support national governments better? And how do we harness a whole of society approach for a safer world? The conversation is only as good as the participants. And the participants that we have today, starting with Mr. Kofi Annan, couldn't get any better. And so we'll start with you. You have spoken loudly and strongly, Mr. Annan on the need for swift and effective response 
and for the need for solidarity, not only in terms of providing resources for first responders, but also for maintaining travel, access, and movement to affected countries. Those are lessons that we've learned. What other lessons have we learned from past pandemics, as well as from the Ebola outbreak, and our responses that should give us guidance as a global community? What should we do differently to ensure that we can build upon lessons from our past experiences? Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be able to join you this afternoon. I think the Ebola epidemic has lots of lessons for us. First of all, we discovered Ebola about 40 years ago. And we could have really focused on it and done some research as to how we counter it, try and see if we can find vaccine and other medication. So it, it's a bit surprising that 40 years later, we come back to it and in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, we are looking for new medication, trying med untested medication to see how far we could go. If we had had foresight, we would have been much further ahead with the cure and treatment <coughs> that we could have used uh, now. When we discovered it 40 years ago and it was contained, what lessons could we have learned? It broke out on a continent with weak medical system. It broke out on a continent where in quite a few of the countries, the health, public health system was broken. They did not have the capacity to do the research required. They didn't have a CDC, uh, disease control centers. Shouldn't we today be thinking of how do we ensure that when the next pandemic hits, I don't care what the name is, we'll be able to tackle it professionally, be able to research it, look for a treatment, and be ready <coughs> next time it comes around. I think on Ebola, we have failed uh, that test. But going forward, I think we should consider setting up disease control centers. I think it would be wonderful to see one in East Africa, one in West Africa, and possibly one in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in Southern Africa. This doesn't have to be uh, necessarily public, publicly funded. It should be public-private arrangements that can help. We should also understand, I was in the States last uh, <coughs> fall, and I was quite amazed at the scaremongering mm -hmm. and the fear surrounding the disease and trying to keep out anyone who has been to West Africa, ignoring the scientific knowledge and the, and the advice that has been given by uh, the director of CDC. And it was really, that forced me to speak out uh, publicly. But I think um, uh, what we, we need to uh, do is to understand that in this interconnected world, Diseases like that will travel. We saw what happened with SARS. SARS came out in Asia. Within 12 hours, it was in Canada. And we should have known, and you said one Ebola uh, anywhere <coughs> is one too many, and we should fight it. And we have to understand we are in the same boat. And it may be in Africa. Where does it hit next? I think I said to the press, that the public and the international community did not wake up regarding the Ebola crisis until it got to the US and UK. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, and it is something which is uh, ununderstandable because we should have known, even before it got there, that it was a question of time, given the travel and interaction. Mm -hmm. And so I will say, I would also encourage pharmaceutical companies to do more work on diseases like Ebola. Those of us who come from the third world and the poor countries sometimes feel that the diseases of the poor are ignored because the companies feel if you invest in it, you may not get your money back. Uh, people may not be able to afford the medication. But I think uh, we have 
it has been proven that uh, pharmaceutical companies and companies can do a lot. I saw what they did with HIV, yes, and I see David Nabori here, we all worked on it together. The pharmaceutical companies helped a lot in bringing down their prices to make it affordable uh, to the poor. And in the process today, we have millions on uh, HIV medication. And we, they could do similar work in areas like Ebola, but of course the governments have to work with them and, and help. I think I should pause here and let others have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Anand. The foresight to look ahead, to make the right decisions for the future. Baroness Amos, <clears throat> listening to what you've just heard from Mr. Anand, and as the UN Emergency Relief Coordinator, recognizing all the challenges in the world and that the world must respond simultaneously, let me ask you realistically, what tools or mechanisms can or should the broader humanitarian community create and execute that might better assist us in avoiding pandemics or plan for the possibilities or help us better in, in our response in the future? Uh, Erzman, thank you. And um, I'm not sure I agree with the way the question's framed. Uh, because I don't think that this is just an issue for the humanitarian community, and therein lies the problem. Uh, you described something which is uh, complex, uh, interconnected, and which requires a swift, flexible, and immediate global response. And what we have is very often an assumption that the humanitarian community will step in and respond. I think as a global community, we have to be much better at uh, analyzing and identifying risks and then managing those risks together. And when I say together, I mean uh, the governments themselves, I mean partnerships with the business community, with our NGO colleagues, with uh, UN humanitarian uh, agencies, uh, but also with uh, governments that are uh, major donors as well. It has to be a partnership. If you look at the scale of humanitarian crisis across the world, no one organization, no one agency, however big, can do this on its own. And I think this is what this current Ebola crisis has really highlighted for us, that it is a major coordination challenge, uh, that it requires us to work in a, a way that we have never worked uh, together before. I think uh, pretty much all of the different elements are there, but how we connect up uh, together, there are glaring gaps in relation to that. And I have to say, as the person who has to coordinate some pretty major humanitarian organizations around the world, that we have agencies with separate mandates, but also overlapping uh, mandates. Uh, we are highly bureaucratic. We were set up in uh, one set of circumstances, and we're having to deal with a very different set of circumstances. So we have to be honest and clear about that, but at the same time, we have to make the changes uh, that we require uh, to move along. So what might some of those changes uh, be? Much more support for prevention. We should not be having to scrabble around to raise uh, money to uh, put in place uh, the supply chains that we might need rapidly. There's no point raising the money after the crisis has happened. Um, we need to have uh, some form of global platform that brings together, for example, uh, the business community uh, with uh, the public sector. We have elements of that everywhere. And of course, we see a lot of that here in Davos, but it's not linked uh, together. Um, we need to have a funding platform where there is uh, money available, substantial amounts of money available for preparedness that we can tap into uh, uh, immediately. And we need to, to clarify what roles and responsibilities are before a crisis hits. There's no point trying to sort that out when we're trying to deal with a major crisis at the same time. Uh, there has to be a commitment from all of us to do that 
uh, together. And one other point, the three countries we're dealing with are all post-conflict economies. I think we are way too short-term in the way that we think about the support that we give to countries like Guinea, Sierra Leone, or Liberia. You have to be in it for the long term. You have to say, as a global community, we are going to be with you for the next 20 years, for example, to help you to build the institutions, to help you to build the capacity. And this is not about you know, us from the outside coming in periodically to solve something and then going away again. It's about a real partnership where you're standing side by side and helping a country and its people to grow and develop. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Valerie. Not a humanitarian crisis, all of us in this together. All of us in this together, but we know another lesson that we've learned is that the countries where the outbreak occurs, the government, the communities must be in control. Professor Samba Sal, thank you so much for joining us. As Mali's coordinator of Emergency Operations Center for the fight against Ebola, Mali was a country that had a case and did what was necessary fast because of country leadership. What lessons did you learn that other governments should take on board? Thank you very much for uh, this question. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizer for having me here to share some of our uh, small experiences. I am so honored to be able to share a panel with such great personalities, my professor and Anne. Uh, thank you for having me here, all of you. Um, I, I am so happy also to see David here, who went to Mali on ground, um, helping me uh, to set up my operations. <coughs> I will start from what my professor Anand and Madame Amos just said. Um, there is no secret. Uh, this epidemic, this current epidemic, um, reach the less poor, the poorest countries around the world. Uh, Mali is one of them. And uh, obviously, there were some key elements absolutely missing. Health system very weak, as was mentioned by Professor Anan. And there was no rapid response solid rapid response system in countries like CDC. And disease occurred, people didn't know, so it was happening for so long in different communities. So that was something really very, very, very weak to avoid. And third, there is no vaccine, no treatment. So what we did in Mali, the minute we hear about this epidemic in Guinea, uh, it was March 21st or 22nd, we uh, did our first emergency meeting at the Minister of Health Office on March 23rd. So rapid, rapid response team was set up the next day. And then from there, we started to, to work together. Uh, so we didn't wait till we saw the, till we see the first suspected case in country, for example. We tried very, in very difficult condition to set up rapid teams. So rapidness is one key element. And while doing that, we started very early to work with community. So you cannot, Ebola is not one minister business. It's not like only the Minister of Health business. All the crisis, pandemic diseases, you cannot say that this is only <coughs> the Minister of Health of your country. This is a government business. This is a national. It's, it should be many, many departments in addition to the community. So we started to work very early with all the government departments and the community. So community at the very peripheral level must be involved. So we started to talk to the village uh, leaders and religious leaders. So that was very, very important because people do not believe uh, when you're talking about diseases like Ebola and new disease in West Africa. So it's difficult to have people to believe. So we start to work on that and um, start to also convince and train community levels so that they can help health workers. 
And uh, number three, we um, clearly start to work on border. We did not close our border because there is no border in West Africa. In Africa, I must even say, it is the same family. It is the same country. Even if you close your border, people will still pass. So we start to accompany the border and do that work very closely. And lastly, uh, the government, the highest level in the country, country leaders was involved at the very high level and tried to take the leadership of the control so that over uh, government ministerial department will take, you know, will take this, we will all take this so seriously. And when, for example, community villages, the, the president of a country will go on the ground and wash his hands while passing the border and let, let the you know, the doctors, the nurses take his temperature. So that way, if the imam or the chief of the village will also come, it's very easy to say, the president did this, why not you? So we did things like that. And um, I, I agree with you, we cannot do, we cannot get success if we don't do a little bit of research. We started vaccine trials in Mali, and I've been one of the participants, uh, one of the first uh, black African to receive this vaccine. And I'm also the principal investigator of the first vaccine trial. So we must go with vaccines. Uh, it's always better to prevent rather to wait for treatment. So I don't know how many time I have left, but I will stop here if there is questions. Uh, I have a lot, a lot to say from the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being with us. And just as is not, one agency, but the entire global community working together. As you said, it's not one agency inside a government. It's the entire government working together and leadership. Yes. And speaking of leadership, let's talk about the public health community. Jeremy, tell us, from a public health perspective, what should we be thinking about? What lessons from a public health perspective should we incorporate as we move forward? Uh, from the public health perspective, what I learned here is that uh, with Ebola, public health services were far away from the community level. So we should think how to get close, how to link so closely the public health uh, services with the local community, you know, traditional healers. Some Ebola suspected cases will go always first to the traditional healer. So they should be, uh, we should find a way to communicate so closely. So communication is a key between those two. And number three, the public health system, routine system should be reviewed so that every country, even if you don't have a right research center, you have to have an emergency center emergency operating center just for pandemic diseases like this and be ready even if there is nothing. Public health system should try to do simulation on a regular basis so we be ready and data should be collected. So those systems are obviously not working because disease can come in our communities and stay for a long time before the government be aware. So that's what I, I, I want to mention here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. So Jeremy Farrar, you've heard what it takes for public health at the local level. When we think about public health at a global level, what should we be thinking about as we move forward? Thank you very much indeed. Um, and just a little bit of background compared to the others in the audience. I'm just a very simple infectious disease physician who has spent the last 18 years living and working in Vietnam. Um, but for some reason, and I promise I haven't brought anything with me today, I have been very directly involved in SARS, in bird flu, in EV71, in cholera, now in Ebola for over the last decade. And one of the lessons from that, and actually pay tribute to a very good friend of mine who lost his life in Vietnam, Carlo Abani, uh, from the World Health Organization during the days of SARS. One of the key lessons for that is these are not rare events. These are actually incredibly common events. I, as a single physician, could talk you through eight or nine epidemics in the last 10 years, either regional or global pandemics such as the uh, 2009 pandemic. And yet, in truth, very, very few countries around the world have got healthcare systems and public health structures that allow them to deal with the day-to-day, -day, let alone the surge that comes when you have major new cases. It would be difficult to imagine any Western city actually coping with what Monrovia's had to cope with over the last uh, year or so. So this is not something that happens to other people far away from wherever you are here in Davos. This is happening all the time 
and has a possibility because of transport and movement of people and because of the way the world works that it comes to affect us all. So we should all own this. And if you ask the question, who's responsible for this? It's everybody in this room. It isn't just ministries of health. It isn't just doctors. It isn't just agencies like we've heard from. It is all of us together. <laughs> And the key lesson, I think, from all of those, and it was true of SARS, it was true of bird flu, it was true of the pandemic, and it's certainly true here of Ebola. And that is that if you don't understand the context of the society that you're working within when these happen, you will not be able to sort these out with purely medical and technical uh, responses. You desperately have to understand the cultural context. And that cultural context and societal context evolves over time. So, if I had a criticism of the Ebola response, which I think actually, <clears throat> at a final point, it got to a good place, uh, it is that we didn't appreciate early enough that 2014 is not 1976, that societies have changed, that when you have a disease in a new area, such as in West Africa, where there are no borders and where people move much more rapidly, where Ebola starts to be transmitted in a major urban centre instead of in a rural setting. The people that live there, the way they respond, the way they act is very, very different. And we were too slow to realise that 2014 was not 1976. Mm -hmm. And that's actually been a lesson, again, over the last uh, decade. Surveillance is critical and setting up public health systems after every single epidemic I've been involved with in the crisis and soon after, there is a call for a response. And I'll just quote you something that was stated. The world is ill-prepared for this or any other global public health emergency. The review recommends sweeping reforms, strengthening health capacity, understanding society, an international reserve, clear coordination amongst UN agencies, and a contingency fund to pay for it. That was written in 2004 after SARS. We're 10 years on, and you could write exactly the same today. This is an opportunity. A crisis is always an opportunity, but this time we must seize it. And it isn't just a case of saying we must change or destroy or get rid of the World Health Organization. We desperately need a unified body that works at the global level, because further fragmentation of healthcare around the world is in actually nobody's interests. But if we want that global body, there are two things that we need to provide it with. Strong leadership and a mandate for that leadership to provide leadership. And secondly, we have to fund it and we have to appreciate that funding needs to come from governments and philanthropy and from industry and from society. And that all of those players are part of that global health community. There is a phrase within some UN agencies, non-state actors. They are crucial to our ability to respond and I believe they should have a voice in those agencies at the highest level. Our good surveillance is critical and we must pick these things up, but we did pick up Ebola in March and we didn't act until September. That six month delay will have cost us a huge amount in lives and economies and money. We must learn to add a response arm to a surveillance arm. Picking things up on its own will not solve the problem. It is critical, but we need an action and that has to be decisive and well led and it would be better to occasionally overreact than, a, than ever underreact. And in this case, I believe, until recently, we've underreacted. So I'll stop there and open it up for the floor. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. We must act, not just surveil, but respond. Not just surveil, but respond as a community. So let's finish with the private sector, Stanley. Are we engaging in the right way today to maximize access to the private sector? And if not, what should we be doing differently? Right, so I've been uh, dying to get into this discussion because I've heard a lot, and Baroness, you, you hit really the, the soft spot there. Look, um, I'm from the private sector. What I do know is we buy low and we sell high. But we know a lot more. What we do know is that Ebola is obviously a humanitarian crisis. It's a terrible thing on the ground. We've seen it on TV. We see it in the newspapers. At the same time, it is destroying an economy in three countries and the surrounding area. It is a security risk for the world. And there is enlightened self-interest in working on this issue. Having said that, I think we'll get through this one. And I was in a, a, a 
discussion the other day with uh, David Nabarro, where I think he pointed out that there's been a lot of resources that have been brought to bear. That's not the issue. The issue is, how do we deal with emergency preparedness in general? I believe the first panel I was on at Davos was about uh, 11 years ago when we spoke about pandemic preparedness. I don't th think we've moved it very far. Have we done better? Yes, we have. I would advocate, and again, I'm not a public health person, I'm not a, a, a multilateral uh, organization, I really don't know much about actually how governments run, but I'm from the business sector. My company is the largest provider of products to dentists, doctors outside of the office, and veterinarians. We ship products, millions of little boxes around the world to about one and a half million doctors in their private, in their private offices. We know logistics. Bring us in early on, mm -hmm. not at the last minute. Get us in on the foundation. We are good in the private sector at organizing. We don't know about disease management from a public health point of view. Sitting in front of me is the director of the UPS Foundation, uh, Ed Martinez. We got a call one day from uh, uh, um, the um, Center for Disease Control, and we were asked, could we send product to West Africa? Well, I think a week later, or two weeks later, a million dollars of supplies, we raised the money, we're on the way. Don't call us in, with, it's too late. Let's get involved in creating the right kinds of public-private partnerships. I don't know who should convene it. If the UN calls, we come. If any of these agencies call, we'll be there. In fact, most companies today view social responsibility as critical. But we want to be brought in and help in pandemic planning and not in the response to a, a, a crisis or a tragedy. So I would advocate for a way in which we can advance public-private partnerships to deal with pandemic planning. I see uh, Mr. Anand saying he's got to get back in on this, listening to you. No, I, I think it's a very important point that if we establish solid relations with the private sector, that we should be able to call on them and share the problems with them. And they have the organization, the capacity, and can re react quickly. But there were two other points I wanted to make. In this particular crisis, a group of African businessmen worked with the African Union mm -hmm. and raise millions of dollars to send health workers to the three countries. And I think that's extremely important mm -hmm. that they take that kind of initiative and we don't always look beyond Africa mm -hmm. for that kind of help. And I would want to applaud the African Union and businessmen such as Strive Masiwa mm -hmm. and Dangote of Nigeria getting everyone organized, and I think they've sent in about a thousand health workers mm -hmm. uh, to the region. The other important thing is the creativity this time that the international, the Secretary General and his uh, team managed to get governments to send in formed units, military units, who can hit the ground running, set up field hospitals, and allow the work to continue, because otherwise you are recruiting people individually and it takes time. It's better to get a team that is used to working together and can get it done. Finally, I would want to say that uh, there was quite a lot of blame game at the beginning. Yeah. When we have crisis and we are trying to save lives, let's focus on that first. The blame game can wait. We can blame people after we've saved lives, but the way it happened this time, it was very disencouraging for some of the aid workers. They felt unappreciated, and as I said on television, these are the modern day heroes and heroines who deserve our thanks and appreciation, but the blame game came too early, and we should push it back for later. Thanks. Don't let pointing fingers get in the way of ending the epidemic and getting it right. I see David Nabarro about to jump out of his chair. So David, you've been referred to several times here as the Secretary General Special Envoy for addressing this Ebola crisis. 
Are we getting it right up here? Is there something that we're missing? What more should we add? I'm sure there's a microphone that they can put into your hand. Right here, David on your left. Thanks very much indeed. And it's really good that uh, the group is looking at this issue from an analytical perspective. Four things. First of all, I just met Professor So, uh, Pre President Ibi Keita, by chance, in the, in the Congress Center. And he stopped, he was walking along, he stopped the entourage he was with, and he said, Nabara, I want to talk to you. So we walked over, in my bad French, and he said to me, uh, Thren, I assure you that I'm going to continue to make sure that we will keep Mali safe in the face of the threat of Ebola. And so I feel that one of the points that you've all made, but that everybody needs to be aware of, is the absolute importance of powerful leadership from the very top. You see, if the health ministry is left to deal with something like this on its own, very quickly it gets overwhelmed. But when the president says, I'm going to make sure <coughs> that we get it right, <coughs> then it makes a huge difference. So I'd really like to reinforce the remarks about leadership. Second point, as we've studied the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, a little bit what Professor Farah just said, we've seen how people, people's behavior has been a really important factor in determining the spread. It's not, this Ebola is not waterborne, airborne, foodborne, soilborne. You get it from being in close contact with people and their body fluids touching you. So anything in society that makes that more likely could spread. And I agree that I think it took time for everybody to understand how important it was to get close to communities and work with them on a partnership response. And I think the reason, everybody, why it all changed so quickly in Liberia between September, when, as we were hearing, we were experiencing terrible scenes in the streets of Monrovia and also out in some of the rural counties. And it changed in two months to a situation now where there are parts of the country that are absolutely free of Ebola is because everybody changed behavior at about the same time. They just got the message. It's dramatic. The third point is to Valerie Amos. Our, our response mechanisms to crisis, they are much better than they were. But at times when you're inside the response, it feels as though each time we're having to learn while we do. That's not criticizing what you in WFP or Valerie in, in Archer are doing, but we're not globally brilliant at working together. Sometimes I think when we're responding to crisis, it would be much better if we could shift and be reactive like a swarm of bees or a flock of birds. You know how you see group birds when they're flying along they all change direction at the same time. But globally, we haven't quite got that degree of mega coordination. So I do agree with what Valerie Amos said, that we've got more work to do. It's not just talking about humanitarian crisis. We've got to be talking about a whole variety <coughs> of crises and a range of new patterns to deal with it. And I think learning from Ebola will give us rich stuff. And then lastly, to Kofi Annan and his point, which I think also Mr. Bergman alluded to, and perhaps that's the best lesson of all, and that is modern responses involve everybody. They don't involve an agency here or an organization there. And perhaps the most important point that I've heard in the remarks so far is let's find a way for all of us to do it together and create these platforms and these mechanisms 
to fulfill the dream that I really heard again, having worked with Mr. Annan when he was Secretary General, and he said, David, we're going to get the price of these AIDS medicines down, and we'll do it by bringing in the companies and bringing in the NGOs and bringing in the health organizations. I think that spirit is really important, and I wish you well. Let's get that right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we open up to the public, We've heard about what we need to do, but we also have the Deputy Executive Director of UNICEF here. And so we are now seeing Ebola orphans. And so what do we need to do differently to ensure that children are protected as we look to the future? Uh, thanks very much, and uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to sort of engage in this discussion. I think it's uh, great to hear all these important lessons learned then uh, to emphasize that, you know, rather than just learning, then we should now start implementing them as well. And thank you also for raising, uh, you know, the important issue of children in this crisis, because, you know, this crisis ha hit, has hit the most vulnerable uh, countries, <coughs> the most vulnerable parts of those countries, and the most vulnerable people in these countries, and obviously children are, uh, are part of those vulnerable populations, and not only have they been among uh, uh, the victims, of the, obviously, but what you also see is that um, children in, uh, in these circumstances lose their caregivers. We all know that schools are closed, so education is becoming uh, a, a big issue, although we're moving at reopening them again. But, you know, caregivers, especially also women and mothers, have also been dis disproportionately affected. And when you look at uh, orphans and the issue of stigma, I think it's really important that, again, you know, in working with communities, which I think has been crucial, uh, as David has also just pointed out, we really only saw uh, getting the real results when we started engaging communities around the real issues here. And I, I think we need to pay, pay tribute to those in communities who have worked here. But it's also a little bit the world upside down, you know, where usually for orphaned and affected children, you have extended family mechanisms that work and that actually, you know, call them in. Here, you know, because of stigma, it's been more difficult to actually use these extended family mechanisms and you actually see orphans being excluded from those traditional coping mechanisms. So again, you know, in working with communities and in sort of explaining to them how to deal with those specific, you know, vulnerable group of people, we will get the results. Although in the meantime, of course, we need to make sure that they're cared for and catered for, and that's what we're doing with our partners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yoko. So you've heard from those who are working on the crisis, those who have had roles in other disease responses, and they say we're all responsible. This is an open forum. Let's hear who you think is responsible. The floor is now open. And I'd ask you to keep your questions and, and comments to two minutes. Thank you very much. Dr. Annie Sparrow from Mount Sinai Global Health. To follow on, um, and probably this should be addressed to Mr. Annan and to Baroness, these epidemics are fueled, as I see it, by human rights violations. They're not just diseases of poverty. We knew about Ebola in March, but we didn't <coughs> respond until two whites were affected. And what I see is... Uh, a revision that we haven't necessarily learned from AIDS, the perfect epidemic fostered and fueled by discrimination, by stigma, where women, children, gays, <coughs> were, with the least agency, were the most affected. With Ebola, it is females on the front line. They are the nurses. They are the caregivers. They are the ones who prepare the funerals. They are the ones who wash the bodies. So that here we have, again, one that is fostered and fueled where it's not only driven by human rights, but the fallout is also those on the children, on the women, and those in education that suffer. These are not just diseases of poverty. We know that infectious disease and diseases of poverty go together. We have to be in it for a long time, for the long term, because infectious diseases are, and they affect all of us. But I see it, uh, although I am a physician and a pediatric and care intensivist, that there are real parallels between the the neglect of human rights and public health, and these are reflected with the rise of infectious disease and, and how they become issues of global security and how they become okay. issues of global governance. So I'd love 
to hear a response. Okay, let's get a couple more questions before we come back to the panel. I see a hand back here. Would you stand up? Can we get a mic over there? Uh, Dr. Pauli, I have worked with the WFP in, in uh, Africa in different capacities. Uh, at the height of uh, the Ebola epidemic, it went through the Western press that uh, a female Al Qaeda member held in the United States uh, had been recommending that her group spread Ebola in the Western countries. My question is it scientifically possible? And secondly, do you take this into account and how? Thank you. Okay, one more before we come back to the panel. Right here. So you were talking about taking actions and responding uh, to the outbreak as soon as it happens, as soon as it is identified. But probably a number of outbreaks is happening in countries with the big public health system or even not exi existing public health system. S and uh, we simply don't see them. So do you think that uh, actual surveillance system is sufficient for the moment? Okay, let's start with the first question. Mr. Anand, do you want to address, uh, was this epidemic filed by the neglect of human rights and public health in these communities? It's an in interesting uh, question. <clears throat> Because um, when we, you bring in human rights, which is a, an interesting concept that one has a right to life, one has a right uh, to good health and good education, and you are confronted with this problem in societies which have very little means, societies where the health system is broken, societies coming out of war, uh, and they alone are unable to tackle it. What responsibility does the international community have to assist them? And how quickly should they offer that help? Do we accept and realize that we are in the same boat? And whether it's happening in, in Liberia, Sierra Leone, or Guinea, that it concerns us all, and we should rally to help. I think this has been basic, uh, is base, it, it, this underlines all the discussion we are, we are having here. And um, uh, I would suggest that it is our responsibility, living in this interconnected world, to help wherever this epidemic breaks. Because you cannot be safe at the expense of the other, or prosper at the expense of the other. Thank you. Baron Samos, did you want to add something? Just to add that I think that um, we're quite often overwhelmed by the complexity of uh, situations. Um, and uh, Kofi has talked about the interconnectedness of uh, all these issues. And you see it very, very clearly in uh, the three countries, but in, in the whole region. And we've been talking a lot about uh, global risks and the complexity of uh, global risks. And the list <coughs> is actually very long. Um, I think the important thing is to ensure that the complexity doesn't prevent us acting because we get so concerned about, you know, is it this element, that element, or that element? Uh, what we need to do is to take a comprehensive approach and think how best uh, different parts of the system can address different elements of it. Mm -hmm. And just very quickly to come to um, the question of uh, uh, the, the, the last question, I think. Um, we, there's a huge amount of data that we have available to us. It's not just surveillance data, it's other data. It's how do we analyze and read that data and take the warning systems, mm -hmm. uh, the warnings that that data mm -hmm. flags up mm -hmm. for us. And how do we support countries uh, with weak uh, systems uh, to ensure that that data uh, is available? Mm -hmm. And how do we ensure that communities and countries aren't frightened by what the data is actually telling them? Mm -hmm. uh, communities and countries will hide things uh, because actually they don't necessarily want to, and I don't mean just in the development world, I mean this is across the world because it's a, it becomes a political leadership challenge. And we have to encourage uh, countries, leaders, communities to actually be open and honest about what the information is and what it's telling us. Mm -hmm. 
Anyone else want to come in on any other question? Yes. So um, I think it's, yes, it is this human rights issue, but there's a more fundamental issue. These three economies are really failed healthcare systems. Now, when we have a failed political system or a failed security issue, the world tends to respond, sometimes too late. But in this case, we haven't responded correctly. Yes, we're trying to deal with the issue on the top, on the surface, the Teflon, the medical issue. But we've put these countries in an isolation ward from an economic point of view. We've stopped the airlines going there. <coughs> we've stopped commerce. Mm -hmm. I think um, I read an article the other day that $25 billion of economic activity in the, in amongst the poorest countries in the world has been destroyed. So what we've done here is we've taken failed economies and made them even more failed. So I think there are two things we have to deal with. One is we have to f figure a way to get the economy back. I think we were talking earlier on, we have to allow people to get back to fishing and not give them food. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have to give food and we have to deal with this medical system, but we have to get these economies back again. And my big fear is what's next? Are these the three poorest countries of the world? Not necessarily. There are even more poorer countries and even countries that are not necessarily as poor, <coughs> but that don't have hmm. medical systems that work. And then I'll add one last thing. The World Health Organization, yes, it may not be functioning perfectly, but if we don't fix it, if we don't give them funding, we don't give them a mandate, who is going to fix this? May I say a, a word about the economic situation? No, I agree with him that the, the economic and social aspects of the crisis in the three countries are not being given enough attention. You've had situations where companies working on major infrastructure projects and important projects have withdrawn their personnel, mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, invoking force majeure. People tell the government, why don't you fire them and recruit somebody else? Mm -hmm. What guarantee do they have that another company would want to bring in the staff? They would use the same argument. And besides, if they invoke force majeure, mm -hmm. they have to pay the cost this poor uh, government. So it's, the, it's a very difficult situation. And Stan is right that as we move forward, this, these economic and social issues are going to really become, uh, come to the fore and create problems for us. We often tend to focus on the political and other things on the surface, while the economic and social bottom is fought, falling out. And this is going to be the next crisis in these countries. So just a quick line. <clears throat> this is not three distant countries. You cannot stop the stuff at passport control. It affects everyone. Switzerland affects the United States, everyone. If we don't deal with these <clears throat> issues, <clears throat> it's going to have a global effect. Yep. Jeremy, take a moment and debunk the myth about the transmission of this disease. <laughs> Well, David's already talked about it. It, it, is, it is very important to understand the tr transmission of diseases, and it was misunderstandings wherever it was um, early on. Ebola can only be transmitted by very close contact with bodily fluids. I can't cough it over you, you can't cough it over me. If uh, Vari had it here today, she wouldn't be giving it to me at the moment. I'd be very happy to sit next to her unless she was going to be sick or whatever. You, it's difficult to catch. The average person will pass it on to just one other person or less. Um, it's only around funerals, it's only around the social context, it's only around the cultural context is which this epidemic has been allowed to <clears throat> go beyond. It's actually not very transmissible. We must let the science lead us and not our own xenophobia. With that, more questions here. I am Adam Mupam from the World Trade Institute. Uh, I was discussing with my distinguished professor and uh, he asked me, Adamu, uh, how do you access the situation of Ebola in uh, West Africa? I hear that West Africans or Africans kiss their deaths. I mean, like, I was like, come on, you know. Just like uh, Kofi Annan said, blame shifting, you know, here and there. How do we assess the role of the press in this scenario? That's my question the role of the press. Let's take a couple more questions. A hand over here. Yes, hi. I'm um, Peter Neiman. I work as a hospital doctor in the United States. And I remember last year as I was working um, in the United States, around September, everybody started to talk about Ebola. 
and um, essentially it was a, a big scare. There's, uh, there's no question about that. People even from India were being quarantined. We were putting people into isolation that really didn't have to be in isolation. I think it was an exaggeration, but in hindsight, I think it was actually a good tendency. I think the media played a very important role in this. I think by making the public afraid of Ebola, I think by getting people thinking about Ebola, um, President, Obama finally t President Obama finally decided to talk about it, and things changed. So my question is, shouldn't we get the media faster into the boat? And isn't it good if we actually scare the public a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> Scaring the public as a tool. That's interesting. Okay, anybody else want to add anything before we go back to the panel? Okay, let's go back to the panel. So, what's the role of the press in our response? And how do we, what's the role of the public? Jeremy. The press is absolutely critical to this. And in fact, if you go back to 1918 and the pandemic everybody frightened of, influenza, and the reason why it's called Spanish flu, the only reason it's called Spanish flu is the Spanish press was the only free press in 1918. The American press, the British press, the German press, the French press were all constrained. It was only the Spanish press that could actually raise the profile of the disease. The press is absolutely critical, and it's no good just blaming them for the message if the community, and those of us on the panel and those in the arm, don't get out there and explain things to the press, they will invent stories sometimes because they'll fill a vacuum. So I think we cannot just blame the press for the bad things that are said if we don't go out there and explain to them what the true situation is. On the issue of fear, I think it's a very, very careful thing to get right. Uh, as a young doctor, I grew up at the start of the HIV epidemic, and I don't think we got the messaging right around that. And there is a very delicate balance between terrifying people leading to chaos and bad actions versus being sensible and in the middle. And I would caution against over over-fearing the public around things. Ben Samus. I, I think it's really important to have an informed public. Um, and the press has a huge role uh, to play in relation to that. But of course, the press itself uh, needs to be informed. I think there's another element um, of this which uh, Kofi, I think, touched on, but which we haven't addressed, which is that there is a whole history of the way the African continent has been perceived, the way that African people are perceived, uh, the way that uh, disease in African countries uh, is perceived, uh, stereotypes uh, uh, abound, and this has played right into uh, all of that. And it's been very difficult to extract the elements uh, that relate to that, that fear mm -hmm. um, and the uh, elements which relate to just lack of information and knowledge about the the nature of Ebola itself. Mm -hmm. And this has made it extremely difficult uh, to deal uh, with some of the ways in which uh, the countries, the governments, the peoples have been portrayed in the media globally. And it's something that we're going to have to address for the longer term. Mm -hmm. Professor Samba. Yeah, um, thank you so much. I would like to s just add on to that, that by saying that the press um, actually is a key component of the Ebola Emergency Center. Ebola is only maybe 10% med medical medicine and maybe 90 to 95% overs. So I would like to say that it's important to not to scare, maybe to worry your community, so to have them worried about this. But first of all, you have to make sure your boss Whomever is the boss in your country, you have to do your best to worry him a lot, to get him be, <laughs> you can correct my English. He, I, I, my job is, since my boss is not in this room, <laughs> is to worry him. In, so if your boss worries about something, then you will get him done. You do the same with the press. You have to train. We organize a lot of training sessions an information session for the press and for the local leaders, not only the press, the traditional healers in Africa. Because a, this Ebola crisis, doctors and traditional healers and imam died first from this. That's, where, that's what we use, actually, to convince them to say this is a contagious thing. You cannot treat this. Thank you. Coffee. 
No, I think it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, the press can be very constructive and very helpful when it has the right information and the right message and it puts it out. But on Ebola, in some situations, the health workers were competing with the politicians. Politicians who wanted to get a, make a political capital out of this, and they are much more visible, and they got their language out there and their position out long before the health people caught up. And when that happens, you scare people. Not only do you scare uh, family members and the public at large, but they tell their wives and husbands and cousins who want to go to this area to help, you are not going. We are not going to encourage you to do this. And I think uh, maybe David will confirm this. At one point, everybody thought there were going to be lots of international health workers going in. It became difficult. In the end, they had to rely more on local health workers, train them and prepare them, which I think is, is, is right. But the scare tactics had a negative e effect to some extent. So I would say that we need the press. The press should be informed and perhaps those of us who are dealing with these issues should rush out the press case to them, give them the information early before the politicians turn them in the wrong direction. Yeah, I, I'm definitely for freedom of the press. I believe in that one. Uh, he, he, here's the issue. The press has a responsibility to educate. Yes, they sell newspapers through headlines. The more newspapers are sold, the more the advertising dollars are. But there's a responsibility to educate. So in 1986, after it was alleged that the first <coughs> patient passed on AIDS to a dentist, people stopped going to the dentist in the United States. Dentists at that time were not wearing gloves, masks, and were not sterilizing. The, pub, the uh, public, part, uh, public, uh, public private partnership was put together, organizations called OSAP, to educate the American public and the dentists on how to deal with infection control. We dealt with that, we worked with the press, and the press got the word out that if you go to a dentist that's wearing a glove, a mask, and sterilizers between procedures, you'll be totally safe. <laughs> I think we got the same issue here with Ebola. We got this, the press out trying to sell newspapers, a couple of politicians, and uh, my wife and I live in the New York area, and there were a couple in that area that got a little bit crazy there and tried to stop, uh, uh, they wanted to quarantine uh, healthcare workers. They're a completely wrong thing. Uh, the press should have gotten out and explained how Ebola is passed on not to quarantine healthcare workers which sold newspapers. I see a hand down here in front, go ahead. Before you can have the press, you actually have to have the information. Sorry. There is a long, long history of cover-ups. The Guinea government covered up Ebola. The Syrian government covered up polio. There are real parallels between the re-emergence of polio in Syria after 18 years and the rise of <laughs> Ebola in West Africa. One was a destroyed public health system, one was a, the others a neglected health systems. But both had government cover-ups. I worked on the cholera epidemic in Zimbabwe. where the government also covered it up there. What I didn't know at the time was the government in Syria had also covered up successfully a cholera outbreak. So before we can even get to the press, which can be used and must be used wisely, you have to have the information. And that's when it comes back to the government. The stigma attached to a government which may want to cover up for economic reasons, for tourist reasons, for st reasons of stigma. No one in Europe wants to get polio Europe doesn't want to lose its certification of polio. I don't think it was any accident last year that we had two public health emergencies of international concern, both in polio and in Ebola. Okay, thank you. So that's okay. the, uh, the So information it. as part of the way forward, the, the need for information. Because the governments themselves to, have to actually provide it. Thank you. With that, uh, David, I saw you wanting to come in again? Okay, anyone, there's a hand back here. Can we get a microphone back here? Hey, good afternoon. Uh, it is really a great pleasure to hear you all talk about the missions that you have to face. 
Um, I am Fernando Morales de la Cruz, and I was born in Guatemala, which unfortunately is still a poor country. Uh, but when we talk about the challenges with Ebola or the challenges that Mrs. Cosin and her team face on emergency relief or Mrs. Amos or Mr. Nanan have faced in their mission, um, perhaps we should consider the analogy of when you have a little fire in the kitchen and uh, you don't extinguish that little fire and then the whole building burns down or even worse, the whole block burns down. And the reason why I bring this up is because as a former journalist, I think that often people ignore that there's a little fire in the kitchen, the government is looking the other way, the private sector or citizens look the other way, and those who could have helped extinguish it didn't do it. So on bringing everything to the media, the challenge is often how do we make governments wake up and do what they have to do when the fire is still small and when it can be extinguished, because in the case of Ebola, we have something very clear that not enough was done at the very beginning. And now that everybody's trying to do enough, perhaps um, it's not enough again. So I would just like to leave my comment like that. And again, thank you, Mrs. Cousin, Mr. Anand, Mrs. Amos, and everyone else for your job. I really admire it. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, <clears throat> we have one more back here. All right, so we talked about that countries should work together on a global scale and that leadership is, is, is extremely important in, for example, Africa to keep the citizens from, away from chaos. But ICT has a major problem since in the last century, globalization has, is a key feature of pandemics, which means that in a blink of a vial, you can have diseases spreading from one place to another in less than 24 hours. And I'm wondering, if we look more in the future, not to Ebola now, but for example, Ebola could mutate or a pandemic in the future. Um, are we, if we're so tightly linked, do we have enough resources in the future to, for example, prevent a pandemic that is as fatal as Ebola or more, but as well airborne? So do we have the resources? All good questions. How do we keep the information or make sure the information is public and available, not just to governments, but to people to ensure the right answers can occur? And to reframe the question a bit from the second speaker, how do we keep rooms like this filled when there is no epidemic to ensure that we can continue to give voice to the work that is necessary? And then finally, because it's not easy, do we have enough money? Do we have the resources? to address the challenges ahead of us. With that, I'd open it up to the panel. Let's start down here with you, Mr. Farrar. Jeremy. At some point, we always have the resources when there's a crisis. Um, but crises are best prevented rather than reacting to. Um, so rooms like this will be filled. If we had the same one two years from now, I doubt if there'd be quite so many people here. And it's, it's retaining that interest over the long term in things which are preventative for which many politicians will never get credit for because if you prevent things, people assume they wouldn't have happened anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's critical that we realize that public health and preventative work is critical if we want to prevent these sorts of issues. And that needs investing and it needs investing over the long term. In answer to the question about we should act early, I, I could not agree more. The difficulty we've got is we don't understand enough of the science to know when we have to act quickly and decisively and in a major way and when, and when we can leave it. And I was very involved in the pandemic of 2009 and many people criticized the response there for being exaggerated and unnecessary. I would strongly disagree with that, but that was the criticism. And I would even venture that actually that criticism of organizations like the World Health Organization had an impact on the willingness and the ability to act quickly in the Ebola crisis because they were burnt by the criticisms before that they'd overreacted. Globalization, I think, is a force for good. Um, infectious diseases spread around the world long before globalization as a word was invented. The plague spread through the whole of the world in the Middle Ages. Globalization is not going to go away. Travel is not going to go away. What we need to learn is to work in the world as it is, and it will be in the future, not as it was in the past. And that's the critical element to me. Yeah, um, I would like to I fully agree with uh, what you just mentioned, but I would like to add into that a um, few things that we are doing in Mali that, and that we think, we believe will help us to keep 
uh, the community, local, the most remote community <coughs> inform on a regular basis. One is um, our EOC, as part of the EOC, we are trying to expand and have at uh, every district level and village level very small local committees, uh, actually very local, so that they keep with uh, weekly meetings and we at the central level, we feed them with uh, uh, weekly information, very local, small epidemiological data, routine data collected on Ebola from the borders, the cordon sanitaires. So we send, we share those information down with them so they know what's going on. And we also keep reminding them about hygiene, and not only for Ebola, but to keep up um, you know, stay in touch with us if they observe any other uh, uh, new uh, uh, events coming in, in, in their locality, so they, they will let us know. So those local committees are really playing a key role in uh, both informing, the, keeping the community informed, local community informed, but also giving us feedback. So there is a good link between us. This is a very good way also to keep the community informed. Coffee? Inform. Nothing? Valerie? Yeah, so I'd like to combine both questions in an answer. We have fire brigades in most civilized countries, but we don't have an emergency response method methodology globally. Uh, the World Health Organization, I said it earlier on, needs to get the resources to get the job done. Then we need to have the right kind of strategic resources of materials ready to go. We have them in some countries, but we also need to have a reserve of trained uh, healthcare professionals that are ready to go out and keep that list current and not call on people when it's too late. So I would suggest that we need to have that fire brigade ready in public health for emergency preparedness. And I, I think with public-private partnerships, we could get that done. Fire brigade ready, Valerie, should we? Well, I completely agree we need more investment in preparedness. I mean, this is something that we've been talking about for a very, very long time. Uh, but it is, it is not the thing that, that grabs anybody's imagination. And politically, it is not the thing uh, that political leaders get a great deal of credit for. So we have to turn that around in some way. Um, the second thing that I think is absolutely crucial is making sure that there is greater public awareness and that this has to be... Um, from the local level um, right, right the way through to uh, the global level. And mm -hmm. communication and public awareness campaigns are critical if the prevention and the preparedness is going to have the impact uh, that we want it to have. So Kofi, I'd ask you, if we have greater public awareness, we build on the fire brigade to make it something that is sexy, that ensures we have it, how do we ensure that we have the public will to continue to move forward to do the things that are necessary for the future? I think if you do have a public awareness and the public makes it clear to the political leaders that this is important to them and push it higher up the political agenda, you will get action. Uh, if the pressure is not on, it's not going to happen. And I think uh, uh, Valerie and Stan are, are right. And, and so, if you get the public engaged, the pressure must be sustained and civil society must put the pressure and fire under the leaders to do the right thing. So Jeremy, you've seen it before. You've been in all of these, in, in, uh, if not all of them, a lot of the diseases that have caught the public's imagination in the past, but we've lost that imagination. How do we maintain the public will? Is Kofi right, keeping I the pressure on? Absolutely, um, and I'm all in favor of the sort of fire brigade model. But we must remember we put fire brigades into villages and towns. We don't expect to fly in a fire brigade from very far away. And the center of gravity for this response has to be local with a capacity and confidence to ask externally, and I accept the challenges of countries that may want to keep things under wraps, but those are less and less now than they were even a decade ago, in my view. Um, but we have to, this is, initially it has to be a local response with the ability and willingness to ask outside when other help is needed. And that actual structure does exist now. It's just over the last five years we've pared it down uh, to a smaller and smaller response. But it does exist. Yeah, but I think if, if it does exist, 
and we have these units in individual communities, and we are able to sustain it and reactivate it on time, in time of need, uh, is fine. But even when you take UN peacekeeping, the way we operate today is, is, when, the, is when the crisis has broken and the conflict is at its peak that we begin to look for troops. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes three, six months to get the troops there. And, and I think we, we used, I used to use the analogy. It's like telling Mayor Bloomberg that we know New York needs firehouses, but we'll build it for you when the fire breaks, mm -hmm. you know, not to have it in place to be able to uh, have, mm -hmm. this is uh, where the problem is. You know. So let's go out for one more round of questions. I see a hand back here in the back. So, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, would t um, sorry. I would like to talk uh, about the responsibility. Um, we in Europe and the Western world, we feel responsible for such things that uh, happened in Africa, like uh, <coughs> Ebola. But my question is, what is the sense when we spend the money and it goes to the corrupt government? And because when I want to give money, I, want, I would like to help the people, the poor people who fight to survive. And I don't want to spend uh, government a new palace or a new um, airplane or such something. Thank you. Government corruption, a good question. And it's a fact that we should, we must contend with in responding to these issues. So we'll ask the panel, let's get a couple more to add on to this. Uh, Martin Desipinto, Economic Crime Intelligence. Um, we've heard a lot of talk about public-private partnerships. Um, and I'd want to ask how would this actually work? Because on the one hand, we've got a government and public whose uh, theoretical uh, uh, objective is prevention. On the other hand, we've got uh, private enterprise where, as far as I can see it, um, the more people you cure, uh, the more money you make, the more um, uh, courses of, uh, of treatment that you sell, uh, the higher your profitability. So I just wonder how uh, you intend to align these, these incentives. Uh, second question would be, um, should uh, uh, in the case of public-private partnerships, should um, private enterprises that use artificial tax structures to avoid paying their, their fair share of tax, uh, which ultimately damages the companies, the, the countries uh, that they're supposed to be helping um, and that they're supposed to be working in, should these companies that use artificial structures be excluded from any form of public-private partnership? Okay. I one more question. Another? There is one. One more question from this side. I will add another question because normally we discuss in the way there are corrupt government and so on. And I will say we are a part of the problem. I will jump to the question. The most of the epidemies come from a weak economy, bad condition, hunger, and so and so on. And before they come to hunger, we have too much war in all this region, and we send too much weapons, not help, to fight against epony. We create many crises before. And this is the reason why I give you, Kofi Annan, the appeal for a human right to peace. This is another, I know it's a big jump, but this is the real reason that we countries, destabilized countries, we have to make another politic. It's not only the question of corruption, Corruption begins in the bad condition from all these countries. So I give you this question to make this context behind the big economy. And this is a question of this weapons, militarization, and so on. OK, you've heard the questions. Who wants to start? I'm happy to start. Go ahead. Um, I, I think, I mean, these questions are all interrelated, and I would say, uh, two key things. One is that it is absolutely crucial that leaders and governments are held accountable. Uh, and we have uh, systems and structures for doing that 
which we very often don't apply. And I think it's important that we uh, apply them and that indeed the, uh, there are often cases where uh, uh, governments that are donors to these uh, countries don't necessarily have anti-corruption legislation themselves in place. So I think uh, there's something there that we need to deal with. The second element of this is that in the kind of work in which you and I are engaged, Earthrin, we have to put the people in need of support at the center of the work that we do. And of course, we recognize that we're working in a very complicated and complex geopolitical environment, which includes you know, corruption, conflict, and everything else. But that's the nature of humanitarian work. It's a recognition that you have that complex geopolitical environment and that we have a responsibility as a humanitarian community to put the most vulnerable at the center of what we do. Jeremy. Epidemics often do start, yes, in countries struggling with public health systems, governance, uh, and economies, but they don't only start there. Um, if I had to say what I think was the most frightening probable epidemic of the 21st century, it'll be antimicrobial drug resistance. It is highly probable that, that will be driven by large Western economies and transported to other countries. So these epidemics don't start somewhere and go somewhere with somebody to blame and somebody to accept the, 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 the consequences of it. These affect all of us and are just as likely to start here in Davos as they are to start uh, in Ho Chi Minh City or Jakarta. We all are part of this and we can't just say this is going to be coming from somewhere else. On the issue of public-private partnerships, we have to, it is absolutely essential. I, as an infectious disease physician, have never invented an antibiotic or an anti-malarial drug. They have come through partnerships with industry. Uh, that's actually, ultimately, and there were problems along the route, how we managed to have decent treatment for HIV drugs in the end. It was that public-private partnership, which people on this panel helped to forge, that was critical to the delivery of those. And we do have to get those incentives right, and then companies have to take the responsibility, we heard from Stan earlier, to meet those responsibilities. Professor Saar. Thank you very much, and thank you for the questions. Um, just want to add on uh, what has been said that uh, uh, it's true there are corruption in Africa, but not only in Africa, there are corruption everywhere at a certain degree. That's one. Number two, uh, I know Ebola, for example, this specific crisis in, in, in West Africa, uh, the way we manage uh, the epidemic itself and uh, most of the uh, funding for the epidemic, it was so specific and we had many, many partners like UN uh, agencies and others. For example, my emergency operating center, I decided to hire a specific managing office. I do not sign checks, I do not see the money. I, I, all I see is if I need a pen or a, a gloves, I'll ask for that and they will bring it for me. So we decided uh, to do that in Mali so that the money will be managed, uh, money and all the materials by an auditing office whose job is only to do this and to <laughs> provide um, a weekly and monthly audit report to uh, uh, the head of a uh, operating center. So we are encouraging to do this, so we have to work together. And most of the time, we also ask donors not to give money if they can just bring their help um, in you know, like materials and equipment to uh, try to handle uh, uh, corruptions um, at this level. So uh, lastly, uh, we're talking about Ebola. If you don't take Ebola seriously, for example, somebody like me, if I'm working in, in, in Ebola and thinking about money, if two things. If I have a lot of money, I have to be aware I will also have a lot of viruses. Maybe I will die from Ebola before getting that money. <laughs> so it's better seriously work. Mm -hmm. uh, not, if you work on Ebola, you can't think about money. Thank you. We're coming to the close of this panel. What I'd like to do, we're in the age of Twitter. When you only have so many characters to say what you mean. So I go back to our panel and say, to the original question of who's responsible, as people leave this room today, what is the message that you would want them to tweet about who's responsible, starting with you, Stanley? 
I don't think any one party is responsible. We're collectively responsible and we can collectively fix the next pandemic and prevent it from happening. Professor Sao. Uh, for me, we have to work so closely. What worries me now is I don't want this Ebola. It's epidemic so far. I do not want this to become pandemic in West Africa. So we have to work hands on together with UN agencies to strengthen our health infrastructure, to keep up with more and more training and to do more capacity building and information and to push for vaccines. Vaccines. Baroness Amos. Uh, we have to work at the community, national, regional, uh, global level. We all have to work together. Jeremy Farrar. Prevention is going to be much better than response, and we need to make sure that we have robust healthcare systems, and when we do have to act, we act with great leadership and decisive action. Kofi Annan. I think we need to be uh, ready for the next pandemic. Pandemics will occur. Ebola is not going to be the next one, the last one. And if it does happen, we are all responsible. We are in the same boat. And we need to pool our efforts and resources to tackle it. So we are all responsible. And we need your help to ensure that the world knows that we are all responsible. And we all share that responsibility as we leave here and we move forward so that the next room that we're in, when we're talking about pandemics, we can talk about what we've done, not what we must do. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.